Good morning, sir. This is uh, Ronald Bailey with U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. Can you hear me? Hey, Ronald. Loud and clear. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. This is Ronald Bailey with U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. It's an honor to speak with you this morning on behalf of our Army audience. Thanks, Ronald. It's great to be with all of you. Thank you. So uh, diving right in, sir, uh, can you please tell me what are some of the qualities and attributes that soldiers and other service members possess that make them good astronaut candidates and, and desired by NASA? That's a great question. I think uh, Army soldiers in general bring a lot to the table um, here at NASA, and we have over the last uh, few decades. Uh, some of those things are just being able to operate uh, in a pretty austere environment, uh, not needing a lot of, um, I guess, amenities, so to speak. So that's one thing. Um, teamwork, of course, is a big deal here at NASA as well. We're not doing anything on our own, so just being able to be a part of a team. Uh, so being a good follower, being a good leader, all those things come from uh, at least my experience in the Army, and it's uh, helped me to be a successful astronaut. All right. Thank you, sir. So uh, to kind of reverse that a little bit is why does the Army have astronauts uh, working with NASA, the manned spaceflight uh, program, and, and how does the Army benefit from supporting that program? Well, why they're here, I, I guess I'm not quite sure, but uh, it's part of the application process that anybody can apply to be an astronaut. And uh, historically, the Army has produced some really great candidates for the astronaut program and have uh, done an incredible job in space. Uh, and so I'm just here to hopefully add to that legacy. And we have some really great folks that are in the program right now. Uh, one actually is on orbit. Colonel Drew Morgan, as you might know, is an Army officer up in space currently. Yes, sir. So looking into the future for the three current Army astronauts, Morgan, McLean, and soon uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rubio as well, how have they and how will they contribute, along with the other astronauts, to NASA's stated objective to return to deep space exploration and lunar landings by 2024 through the Artemis program? Well, all three of those will have great opportunities to uh, help NASA, help our nation uh, get back to the moon and uh, eventually go to Mars. So they're all going to be part of the Artemis program. Um, Colonel McLean just returned from the space station. Colonel Morgan is there now. Colonel Rubio, I don't know if his first flight will be to the International Space Station or to the moon, but all three of them should have bright futures here at NASA with the Artemis program. All right, thank you. So one of the things that Colonel Morgan himself mentioned before his own flight to the International Space Station on the historic 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission was the interesting contrast between the U.S. effort at the time and how that has changed to the international and cooperative effort that we have today in space exploration. How important will this cooperation be in returning to the moon and beyond? Well, the international cooperation and private partnerships we're, we're doing now are going to be critical to helping us uh, accomplish our missions, and that is to have a sustainable presence on the moon eventually um, and then go to Mars. So we're going to have to work with other countries, work with other companies to make all this happen. Excellent. So uh, what are some of the important differences and challenges between operating in low Earth orbit and what will be faced for deep space exploration and turning, returning to the moon that the spaceflight program is working through today? Well, I don't know all the technical challenges there, but uh, it's definitely, you know, just a, the distance for one is a big deal. We're about 250 miles at the most right now um, above Earth on the International Space Station. When we head out to the moon, we're talking 240,000 miles. So uh, just a factor, you know, a huge factor difference in the distance. So getting there and the orbital mechanics are things that our, our teams are working through and our engineers and scientists to make sure that we can get there safely, get there efficiently, um, and be able to spend some time eventually on the, on the surface of the moon. All right. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, how important is it for young soldiers and youth in general to, to, to enter into STEM career fields. I noted uh, you yourself uh, uh, graduated from uh, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point with a degree in aerospace engineering. So how important are STEM career fields to NASA and to the country as a whole? Well, they're very important, and uh, hopefully that's something that we, when we go out and talk to students, that's what we're talking about, is uh, hopefully getting them excited uh, and inspired maybe to follow in, in our footsteps and do, do something in the STEM-related fields. Uh, our nation in general needs that greatly. Um, we're, we're, I'd say, falling behind in the STEM research fields uh, compared to other 
things that, that students can do. So we hope to get some students excited about it so that they can continue this incredible legacy that our nation has uh, at NASA, as well as other companies in the STEM fields. All right. So what would you say from your Army career and your education has most prepared you to be a successful astronaut? Uh, well, even though you know, all of us have a lot of education here, it really comes down to uh, people, right? So it's all about how you interact with people, um, how you can be a team player, how you can be a leader at times, um, and all that are, are things that I learned in the Army. So it's really, really helped me personally um, with all those attributes I gained from the Army to be here at NASA. All right, sir. So um, more for our military families. Uh, do astronaut families experience how, how do they experience and handle family separation like military families do? Is the experience similar? How do they get through that? I know uh, you yourself had uh, gone to, to, to Baikonur uh, with uh, Colonel Morgan's family to, to help them through that process when he launched to the space station. So talk to me about that, that family separation. Is that a similar experience that, that military families have? You know, the families are obviously a huge part of everything we do here, just like they are in the military. And you're right, that the separation, you know, in some ways is very similar in that you're just not around for extended periods of time. Uh, it is a little bit different when you're going off the planet. Um, so the families, you know, all the families probably, uh, I would guess, deal with this a little bit differently. Uh, and I did have the, the absolute privilege to take the Morgan family over to launch and got to really be, you know, with, with them and, um, kind of see the stressors that were maybe placed on them and help them through that. Uh, but we do have a great family support network here at NASA, um, just like you do in most military units, um, that takes care and, and has plenty of resources for the families uh, when the, the spouse or the crew member is gone. All right, sir, can you talk to me about some of the, the uh, experimentation that Colonel Morgan, Lieutenant Colonel McLean, uh, had performed and are performing now that are going to help NASA in the future with that deep exploration. I know he's involved in a lot of medical and scientific research. You know, can you expound upon some of that that's going on now for the future? Yeah, all the things that uh, Colonel Morgan is doing on board, uh, they were in my in my mind. There's two categories. They're they're either helping people here on Earth or they're helping us with future exploration. And that's the same. Uh, mantra, I'll say, that, that was going on when I was on the space station a few years ago and Colonel McLean just experienced as well. So I don't know the specific uh, experiments that Colonel Morgan's working on to help us with uh, future exploration, but I know there's plenty of them up there going on now that he and his crewmates are working on to help us. All right. And now the, the International Space Station itself is, ex is essentially a national laboratory. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So uh, I just got one final question before I close out with you, and again, it's a privilege to speak with you this morning. Is it possible that an Army astronaut might be the next or possibly first female astronaut to return to the moon in 2024? And how are those decisions made? When might, might we actually know that? That's a great question. Uh, it certainly is possible because Colonel McLean uh, is kind of in the window. She just recently returned, and we're going to be putting the first woman on the moon in 2024. So timing-wise, that could work out. Um, that's not up to me. That's not my decision. But um, our leadership, um, who, who is here now, will work with the headquarters at NASA to figure out the correct crew um, to put on that first mission and getting that first woman and next man on the moon in 2024. All right. Is that something we might know within the next year or so? I mean, how far out are things like that typically forecast? I know missions 18, 24 months in advance, usually when the astronauts receive their assignments. That is uh, what we've been working on um, currently with the International Space Station missions that we've been assigning. I think this one might get announced a little bit before that. So uh, we'll see. Hopefully in the next year or so, uh, we'll at least have the crews named. All right, sir. Since the last astronaut class graduated in, uh, in, uh, uh, was from uh, 2017, is, is NASA set to uh, host another astronaut candidate class here in the near future? I think so. I think I've heard uh, that the, the next class will be 2021. So we're gearing up already, believe it or not, to uh, get that announcement out here in the next, you know, within the next year, and then get the candidates started applying, and then uh, we'll start going through those and interviewing the, the top candidates and announce that class in 2021. All right. Hey, that's all I have for you this morning. Thank you so much for your time, sir. It's an honor to speak with you on behalf of the uh, Army Space and Missile Defense and the Army audience, and uh, appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Ronald. All right. Good day. Good day.
wise there. Thank you. A 10% chance of coming in at noontime, also about 2 p.m. for this afternoon. So the forecast overall, we're going to deal with the winds out of the southwest to the west, about 10 miles an hour about uh, later on this afternoon in the evening. That's not going to be of a release. It's going to have to still continue with that heat and humidity. Maybe a little spotty showers we get into, uh, say, Friday. Yesterday we hit 98. We started off at about 71. So the forecast for today of 98 degrees, winds out of the west at 5 to 9. Heat index is high as One minute. 105. By tonight, down to about 74. Winds continue out of the west at 3 to 5 miles an hour. On a partly cloudy sky, it's going to be very warm and muggy. Here's the seven-day forecast, which always includes the weekend. Tomorrow of 99, would not be surprised if we hit 100 in a few spots. Saturday of 98, we're going to go into this weekend very hot and also humid. By Sunday of 96 degrees, we cool down to a, a pleasant 96. And then we're back up there for Monday for the working school week of 97. Tuesday and Wednesday, I kind of bump back just 30. a little bit between 98 and 100 degrees. And overnight temperatures there will range in the low to mid-70s. Rain chance is going to be about a 20% chance for each day of the week. Our local time now is about 6.47, 13 now before the hour. Let's get back to our news. Check in with Courtney. Thank you so much, Jay. NASA has been at the center of attention lately as there has been plenty of celebration commemorating the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11's visit to the moon. NASA is now committed to landing the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. Colonel Shane Kimbrough, a proud Georgia native, is joining us live to talk about how NASA will make this happen. Good morning to you, Colonel. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So you were in space for like almost 200 days. Tell us a little bit about um, how, how that was for you. Uh, it was an amazing trip, obviously, um, to get off the planet and experience uh, something really unique for most of us. Uh, and to, to share that with my crewmates was an absolute thrill. We were up there about six months. Uh, had a lot going on up there with spacewalks and a bunch of maintenance and, and new experiments and things like that. So we really had a great time. Fantastic. So there's been this big announcement. NASA is preparing to not only put another man on the moon, but they're going to put another of oh, oh, the a first woman on the moon. Talk a little bit about that initiative. Yeah, it's exciting uh, with the Artemis program. We're gearing up for 2024. That's the big line in the sand now that we're all working towards to get, like you said, that first woman on the moon and the next man on the moon. Now you're a Georgia native. Got a shout out to your Georgia Tech <laughs> Yellow Jackets. Um, talk a little bit about how you get to, how did you get to where you you are and and how you might be able to inspire. Uh, any young person may be looking in on the, on the way to school to get from, from that to, to, to being an astronaut. I know that's a big question, but how did that sort of kind of happen for you? Yeah, I, I grew up in Smyrna, just outside of Atlanta. I uh, went to you know, public schools there and then eventually went to the Lovett School in Atlanta for my high school years. And then I went to the United States Military Academy from there, not knowing that I was going to be an astronaut. I, I certainly wanted to be one. Uh, everyone, I think, my age at the time wanted to be one because when we were small children, men were landing on the moon back then in the late 60s and early 70s. So uh, we all kind of wanted to do that. Uh, I just got lucky enough to eventually to do that. I, I started a career in the Army. Uh, then I went to Georgia Tech throughout my Army career. Uh, the Army sent me there, so that was really fantastic for me. Uh, I graduated from there and then got lucky enough to come to NASA and be an astronaut in 2004. That is absolutely amazing. Uh, best wishes to you and the crew at NASA. I know there's a couple of generations who were not around for the first uh, walk on the moon, so it'll be exciting uh, to see this one. And, and the fact that you all are including a woman is even more excited. Don't be a stranger. And when you're in the Augusta area, the CSRA, come, come and see about us, Colonel. Oh, I'd love to. Thanks for the invite. Have a great day. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We'll be right back with more news, weather, and uh, your headlines with uh, Jay, Stephanie, and Mark on the way. Thanks so much for listening in and watching.
Thank you.